So again, I'm just going to give you an overview of the fat-soluble vitamins, but it's really going to be up to you to go into the course materials and learn all the functions of the various vitamins and what can happen when deficiency or toxicity occurs. But I just wanted to highlight some of the, the overarching or higher level concepts that emerge from the fat-soluble vitamin unit. So remember, fat-soluble vitamins need to be transported with other lipids and they're stored with lipids too. And because they're stored on the body within adipose tissue, they're more likely to be toxic. So we have four fat-soluble vitamins, vitamin A, D, E, K, attic, as I like to remember it. Vitamin A, one of the first things we should know is that there are several different forms of vitamin A, or what we call retinoids. There is a form of vitamin A from plants that's not yet ready to go. It's We call it pro-vitamin A, and this pro-vitamin needs to be converted into um, retinol, in order for it to be able to function properly and then has to be activated a little bit further beyond that into retinal al with an a so retinol needs to be activated into retinal or retinoic acid which are the active forms of vitamin a okay so pro vitamin a from plants needs to be activated into retinol which is the form of vitamin a that we find in animal products and retinol needs to be activated into retinal, I know, <laughs> or retinoic acid, which are the active forms of vitamin A in order for it to perform its function. Now, the main thing people know about vitamin A is that something to do with the eyes. It's good for eyesight is usually what people know about it. I'm actually going to spend time going through this slide because I think people might have a little bit more difficulty with it. So I just want to give you an overview of what's going on. Okay, so remember the active form of vitamin A is something called retinal, A-L. And retinal, it kind of tells you where it works. It works in the retina. The retina is a, is a structure at the back of the eye that receives visual stimuli and helps take that visual stimuli and send a message to the brain about what's going on. Okay. Retinal in the eye, in the retina, <laughs> is usually bound uh, within a complex called rhodopsin. So retinal plus the, um, the protein opsin, they're bound together. Now again, it's found in the retina. When visual stimuli hits rhodopsin, you'll notice it changes shape. And when this change in shape happens, a message is sent to the brain saying, I saw something of this nature, basically. After that message is sent to the brain, those two components, opsin, the protein opsin, and retinal from vitamin A, they what we call dissociate, they break apart, okay? In order for me to reform rhodopsin so I can keep interpreting visual stimuli, I need enough vitamin A. Because again, vitamin A helps to form that retinal, which is part of the, the, the visual pigment rhodopsin, which helps us interpret light st stimuli, okay? So vitamin A is critical for the visual pathway, which is what this slide implies, okay? Vitamin A is also involved in gene expression, whether a gene is, gets coded into a protein, it also has an immune function, and carotenoids from plants, these also have an antioxidant function. Okay, so remember antioxidants, they donate electrons to free radicals to neutralize them so they stop, so they don't steal electrons from other structures like DNA or cell membranes. So antioxidants really, they limit the damage that can happen in the body, which is really important for healthy aging. Okay, vitamin A is also actually part, if you've ever heard of Accutane, which is a treatment for really severe acne. Accutane, actually one of its main active ingredients is, is vitamin A. Um, and because it can be toxic as well at higher levels, this is only available by a prescription and um, usually has some kind of negative side effects before the acne uh, clears up. You actually find retinoids in a lot of skincare products uh, and it's believed partly to do with its, um, its, its function in gene expression, but also its antioxidant function. Okay, this is fun just to talk about quickly, which is the fact that a lot of when I was a kid, <laughs> I used to eat a bunch of carrots and then go into my, my room at night, turn off the lights off, and like try to see if I could see better. 
because my mother had told me that carrots help you see better at night. This is an urban legend. And it's an urban legend that was actually started by the British Air Force during World War II. They had this big propaganda campaign to tell people to eat more, more sources of vitamin A to improve their night vision. Well, that's not actually what vitamin A does. Yes, vitamin A supports the function of the eyes and can help prevent night blindness, but it doesn't like, it doesn't like <laughs> help you like totally see better at night. It doesn't help you do that. What was actually going on, why the British did this is that they had invented a new form of radar that helped them see better at night and they wanted to hide it from the other troops. So it's kind of an interesting thing how some things that are, that are, propaganda can actually become what people believe is true into the future. Vitamin A is available in both plants and animals, but the form of vitamin A depends on whether it comes from plants or animals. Vitamin A deficiency, like I said, can lead to night blindness. Seropthalmia is an early stage of night blindness where uh, the eye becomes very dry and often itchy as well. But if uh, vitamin A deficiency isn't corrected, it can lead to breaks in the cornea and even blindness. So it's a big deal. And if you've never experienced night blindness, I didn't when I was a kid, when I was younger, but now I notice that like as I drive the the Sea to Sky, Sky Highway in in Vancouver, especially at night, that I have a harder time differentiating between uh, structures, and I never had that before. So I gotta, gotta maybe up my vitamin A <laughs> intake. But this is like what the Sea to Sky Highway or like any highway at night, maybe not this bad, but might look like to someone with night blindness. So this is definitely something we want to prevent. Vitamin A can be very toxic at high levels, but only the um, animal version of it, the preformed vitamin A, can be um, can be toxic. Carotenoids, okay, those are the the preformed vitamin A from plant products. If you eat too much of those, worst thing that can happen is your skin turns orange because it is a pigment. Okay. But toxicity from preformed vitamin A, which can happen actually from eating polar bear liver, which is why the polar bears are here, can lead to elevated pressure around the brain, dizziness, nausea, headaches, quite uncomfortable. Vitamin D, uh, what I want people to think when they think vitamin D is I want to think vitamin D, calcium, okay? Vitamin D is really important for calcium homeostasis. So if we want to make sure that our calcium levels are good, we need to make sure that we have enough vitamin D in our diet. However, vitamin D is actually not found in that many uh, foods. It's only found in fatty foods. Um, salmon is a really good natural source of it, but quite honestly, the main vitamin D we get is typically from fortified uh, milk products. Milk does not naturally contain vitamin D in it. Usually a form of vitamin D, vitamin D3, is fortified into milk. Um, because it is so important for calcium absorption and because it's a good way of getting it into the body. Vitamin D can also be gotten <laughs> from the sun, but I'm going to get back to that in a second, okay? Vitamin D has a lot of different roles in the body beyond calcium homeostasis as well. It also has roles in cellular growth, immune function, and, and is involved in the reduction of, of inflammation too. So when the sun comes out in Canada, usually I see on social media, people are like, I got to go get my vitamin D because they're going outside and getting some sun. I want to make it clear to you that vitamin D doesn't like come down through the sun and like you get absorbed through the skin. That's not how it works. The sun doesn't have vitamin D in it. What the sun does have is a type of UV radiation, of ultraviolet radiation, UVB light, which when that radiation hits the skin, this leads to a conversion process that helps convert a, a precursor of vitamin D into a more active form. This more active form will have to be further modified by both the liver and the kidneys to eventually get into active vitamin D. Precursors of vitamin D include cholesterol, so we need enough cholesterol in the body, which is usually not a problem. But one of the issues here in Canada is that we often don't get enough of this radiation, especially in the winter, in order to promote vitamin D synthesis this way. So vitamin D supplementation is often something that's recommended, but it really depends on, on how much you're getting from your diet as well. Vitamin D deficiency uh, in kids can lead to a condition called rickets. Here are rickets. You'll notice that the legs 
bow out instead of being kind of more of a straight line and they bow out because vitamin D deficiency compromises calcium status and so nice rigid bones enough calcium status nice rigid bones okay inadequate calcium status due to perhaps inadequate vitamin D as a child grows up their bones end up bowing outwards because the pressure of the body is pushing down on those weakened bones. In adults, um, vitamin D deficiency doesn't lead to rickets. It's a kid thing, uh, but it can lead to a precursor for something called osteoporosis. And osteoporosis, I like to think like, here's a strong whole bone, okay? This is osteoporosis, where your bones are more porous, they have more holes in them, and they're more fragile and likely to break. Vitamin D toxicity is a severe condition. It is rare from food, as almost always, but it's typically from over supplementation, okay? One of the biggest issues with vitamin D toxicity is that it can increase blood calcium to a point where that calcium starts hardening the tissues. Hardening my arm isn't a big deal. Hardening of the heart, hardening of the kidneys, this is potentially very negative. So again, don't worry about food. But if you are over supplementing, that is a, a, a potential issue. Okay, vitamin E is actually a generic term for about eight different forms of this vitamin. Uh, the main one you'll typically see, and you'll you'll if if a product has been fortified with vitamin E, you'll usually see alpha tocopherol on the the label. Its main role is an antioxidant role. Okay. And there's been lots of studies into vitamin E because it's known as an antioxidant, because people with the highest vitamin E levels in their body tend to have the lowest risk for mortality. There's been lots of studies into like vitamin E supplementation and reduced risk of mortality. However, they have not been able to establish a decreased with risk with supplementation. And there's been a lot of studies into this. So kind of the take home message is make sure you get enough from foods. And we find vitamin A in a lot of oily foods, again, because it's a fat soluble vitamin. Uh, deficiency is rare, but uh, toxicity is typically due again to over supplementation. And an interesting kind of case study of this, uh, a number of years ago, there was kind of this mysterious lung illness that occurred in a number of people that consumed a, t uh, a particular vaping product. And in some cases, it resulted in death. In other cases, it re resulted in severe respiratory issues. And they later found out that the vaping um, oil that these people were using was really, really high in vitamin E. And we're still kind of researching what happened with that. Maybe they already know by the time this video comes out. But it's believed that the high levels of vitamin E within that product was partly responsible or entirely responsible for those lung issues that were evidenced. Okay. Last vitamin. Yes is vitamin K and K for coagulation. I know coagulation is spelt with a C, but in Danish, it's spelt with a K and that's where this name comes from, okay? Vitamin K is needed in order for blood cells to clump together to form a blood clot, a process called coagulation, okay? So blood cells, for them to clump together, we typically need these like sticky strings of protein called fibrin, okay, fibrin fibers. And these sticky threads of protein help for blood cells to clump together to form this clot. Vitamin K is needed for the formation of fibrin so blood can clump together, okay? So vitamin E is, sorry, vitamin K is needed in order to synthesize something called prothrombin, which when activated, activates another proenzyme, fibrinogen, into its active form, fibrin. So really important for the coagulation of blood, okay? Deficiency is rare except for in newborns. When you are born, you are, one of the first things you're given is a shot of vitamin K because it's not, it's pretty much the only micronutrient that's not heavily available in breast milk. So we don't want kids to bleed out because they're their blood isn't clumping properly, so we typically uh, give them this shot of vitamin K. What's interesting is that if we do block the vitamin K pathway, what can happen is that blood doesn't clump together, 
Okay, and we want our blood to clump together when it needs to, but not overly as well. But if blood doesn't clump together at all, it tends to be very thin and it increases the risk that we, we bleed out excessively. We need our blood to clot in order to like clog those blood vessels that are, let's say, broken. Let's say when I cut myself, I don't just want to bleed uncontrollably. I want my blood to clot to like <laughs> block that leakage. Uh, there are certain products that block the vitamin K pathway leading to that thinning of blood that can promote excessive bleeding. And what's really actually interesting is that these products first came to market as a rat poison <laughs> that caused rat death by excessive bleeding. However, now products that again block the, the vitamin K pathway, like this drug called warfarin, are actually prescribed for individuals that are at higher risk for heart attacks and strokes, where a blood clot could block an already narrowed artery. So in individuals that are at higher risk for that warfarin, like lower doses, like not bleed, you're going to bleed out levels, but lower doses are given to, to help prevent those things from occurring. So fat soluble vitamins, these are ones that need to be transported with lipids that are more likely to cause uh, symptoms of toxicity. But again, just like I said with the water soluble vitamins, I recommend going through each of these and making up a chart. What are its functions? What are the symptoms of deficiency? You can put rare as one of them. <laughs> Symptoms of toxicity, again, sometimes the answer is just rare. And where can we find these types of foods as well? That's how I recommend studying for these units. See you in the next unit.